lost sight of. Being a good Roman Catholic myself, I can take shots at the church. Well, you can too. I'm not sure if I'll believe you, but you're welcome to. The church had a deep psychology around what was called sin. They lost the psychology and leaned on the moralism, and they lost the psyche. The, to counteract these dispositions of the soul, there are seven moral or what I want to call psychological antibodies that can aid one in resisting and overriding these impulses. They are the three cardinal virtues, faith, hope, love, and what the church called four ordinal virtues, prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. Furthermore, each sin is a manifestation of love. Now this, I find when I teach the Divine Comedy, when students pick this up, it takes, it takes the moral ring out of the poem and allows them to see love, I think, on a much broader and, I don't know, maybe healthier, I don't like that term, maybe fuller, yeah, fuller, a basis. So that all seven sins are forms of loving in this way. They are either expressions of love excessive, there's too much of it. Love diminished, there's not enough. Or love distorted, it's a form of love that has been torqued out of shape. It seems that lust might be a witness to love excessive, for example, sloth as an expression of love diminished, and anger of love excessive and distorted. See, these are psychological realities. So I don't want us to get caught on the word sin and miss the larger psychological movement of what these dispositions of the soul are doing both constructively and destructively. So the movement of the Divine Comedy is to harmonize the will and the intellect of one soul, Dante himself, as he travels through the distortions of hell, the hopeful suffering of purgatory, and the beatific vision of paradise, where he loves, this is Dante's language, in due measure. There is a harmony of the will and intellect with the intellect of the primal love, capital letters, that created the uh, universe. That's, that essentially is what the poem is about. There are libraries, literal libraries, written on this poem alone. We're looking at two scenes and quickly. All right, so if you, if you hold on to that notion of love excessive, love diminished, and love distorted, the right ordering of the soul is to get those um, imperfect ways of loving um, righted to a more harmonic form of loving. That's where the poem heads. Okay, in that context, Dante is dizzy with the stormy necessities of this region and grows more so as Virgil recounts over a thousand examples of lust in history. Less ambitious, Dante sees two doves flying through the air overhead and discerns they seem to be stuck together. He asks Virgil if he might speak to them. Virgil responds, call to them and they will come. On hearing Dante's call, the two doves, in a moment when the winds abate, enough for them to control their own flight, they approach Virgil and Dante, quote, 
through the malignant air so powerful had been my Dante's loving cry. Now, it's been pointed out for centuries, and you decide if you have or will read the poem, that, uh, or have read the poem, that this scene of Paolo and Francesca is perhaps the most popular or well-known of the hundreds of vignettes that appear in this poem. And so I have to ask, what accounts for such attraction? What is it about illicit love and clandestine lovers who, while married, begin an affair with one another, as is the case with Paolo and Francesca? Hardly ever does it end well, as soap operas have been telling us for thousands of years. But that seems to be a weak impediment for its strong and persistent survival as a human action. Yeah, we'll get away with it. Love knows no boundaries of convention. Love snubs boundaries and will burn the edges off of decorum to satisfy its ferocious yearnings. Love is ferocious. And Dante is no less excited to hear their story. If you're not going to do it, then I want to hear a story about somebody who did. You see, he's already caught in the atmosphere of lust. Can knowing, can the desire to know be lusty? You don't need to answer that. The people are waving their heads in all kinds of ways. You decide. It's rhetorical. Unless you just want to have your confession heard. <laughs> no, no, I'm teasing. So Dante's no less excited about the story, for his response is both of curiosity as well as disarming pity. Perhaps we have birthed in this passage the infancy of the romance novel. I think the romance novel comes out of the Middle Ages. The excitement of illicit behavior outside of conventions, of social norms, as well as the challenge of pulling it off. If I even dare use such a phrase at this juncture. Thank you, a couple of you in the front row got that one. The intact couple alights next to Dante. Francesca steps boldly forward while Paolo, beside her, weeps during the entire exchange. Now I have to tell you that in the poem, uh, this scene takes two pages of over 14,000 lines. And yet it is, if not the most memorable moment in the poem, it ranks right up there. She tells her story of how she and Paolo, the brother of the man to whom she was married, and the latter as murderer of both of them, when he discovers their affair, were reading a romance one day when they were both seized or indeed wounded by the arrow of arrows. And well, they stopped reading in order to enjoy in the flesh what they had been imagining on the page. It includes a tale about the care needed over what one decides to read. But not before Francesca, in a moment of seduction, of Dante himself, quotes from the latter sonnets from La Vida Nuova. Now this is, this is, a, this is a undercut. This is a low blow. 